Canto 19 shifts register. It begins with a great declaration and lots of the commentators remark that these declarations, these kind of rhetorical outbursts from Dante the poet and actually by the end Dante the Pilgrim too mark something very significant that's going on in this canto. I think one way of understanding it is that this is a move from just personal sin to systemic failings across medieval society, particularly the medieval church, but I hope to see and show that it's actually also something that's quite endemic in our culture now that this canto is pointing towards. It's not just a medieval problem. If anything, it's become such a problem now that we hardly even see it. So there's lots of rhetoric, there's lots of looking at the bigger picture, as it were, things from the top down, as well as encounters with individuals from the bottom up as well. Dante says he's going to sound his trumpet about these concerns. Um, it's an indication too of what's going on for him in this canto, um, which is about his deeper learning, his gaining a capacity to speak truth to power for himself at this point in the descent that Dante the poet then echoes in the style of the canto as a whole. It begins with this opening declaration of O Simon Magus and leads to um, uh, Dante declaring about God's justice, God's wisdom, here we will see it worked out. And it signals for us that the um, kind of guiding sin, the guiding um, entrapment in this canto is that of simony, um, after the name of Simon. Simon is the character in the Acts of the Apostles who sees Peter, interestingly also called Simon, um, but a very different inflection. Um, he sees Peter um, casting out uh, demons in the name of um, the Holy Spirit and he asks Peter whether he too can have that power and how much it will cost. So he wants to exchange um, money for um, spiritual power um, and it leads to him being cursed by Peter and to his own undoing. And from that point onwards, the desire to, you might say, also exchange temporal goods for spiritual goods, even confusing things that are temporal for things that are eternal and spiritual, that becomes known as the sin of simony. In the medieval church, it becomes particularly aligned with the excesses um, and the wealth, and also the preoccupations with temporal power of the medieval church. That, at one level, is what this canto is going to focus on. But I think it also raises issues that all spiritual institutions face, because they all inevitably get caught up in their temporal um, continuance um, in the power that they operate in the secular world as much as uh, what they open up spiritually for people. So that's why this canto um, is not just about individual sin but is about systemic problems and is not just about the medieval world but still speaks very directly I think and very powerfully to our world now. So let's see what happens. Um, after the opening declarations, um, we return to things from Dante the Pilgrim's point of view. And he says that he sees in the next of these Bolgia, the next of these trenches that are circulating around Malabolge, he sees inside them holes, um, kind of like um, rocky entrances to tunnels. And Pointing out of these tunnels are lots of feet um, from the calves up. Um, the knees and the ankles and the feet are writhing around, kicking. And part of the reason for that is that he also notices that on top of each of the feet are flames that are burning. Um, he sees that the feet are covered um, with a kind of oiliness and that the flames are dancing around, burning from this oil that's on the soles of these souls. Um, it's a 
perversion of the flames of the Holy Spirit, which of course, again in the Acts of the Apostles, were said to dance around on the heads um, of the anointed. And of course, the anointed um, in the sacrament are anointed with oil, um, which now is causing them pain as the oily substance on the soles of their feet that the flames are feeding off. He makes a very interesting remark about the holes that he sees these legs pointing out of as well. Um, he says that they remind him of the baptistry in Pisa. Um, and um, there, um, if you can imagine the baptistry being a kind of big pool, um, and in the pool um, are um, kind of um, canonical, um, sorry, a circular, cylindrical, cylindrical um, uh, um, sort of uh, insertions within which a priest could stand so they wouldn't get wet, um, but they could lean over um, almost like kind of pulpits in the baptistry. Um, they could lean over um, and baptise um, individuals um, uh, in the water around them without themselves getting wet. And this doubly reminds him of this image because he remembers a time when um, someone got stuck in the baptistry. There's a lot of speculation about um, who that might be. Um, you know, the implication is it was a, a young child that got stuck and was at risk of, da of drowning. And Dante, to save um, this individual, um, smashed the baptistry and got them out. And um, again, a lot of speculation about why um, Dante should bother telling us about this um, uh, part of his history. Um, sometimes it's said that he's trying to say, look, even though he smashed a baptistry, um, it was for good reason. Um, and so he's not um, himself guilty of, um, you know, of, of sacrilege. Um, I think actually the story has a deeper symbolic meaning, of course you might expect. Um, and it's that he, as it were, smashed um, the baptistry to save a soul, whereas the Simoniacs, those who are guilty of um, this sin, particularly um, the church leaders, what they're doing is smashing souls to save the church. It's a kind of inversion of what they should be doing. It's a, um, another way of understanding Jesus's remark that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And religious institutions are very inclined to invert that and think they've got to keep the institutional practice or the institution itself going, regardless of the souls that it damages on the way. Um, and so Dante remind, remembers this story and then declares, um, yes, um, let this be a picture of the truth. Let this story in my own past, where, yes, I smashed a bit of the church, but to save a soul, let that be a picture of the truth. And in some ways, his declarations that follow are going to be a kind of truth speaking to power, smashing down the power in order that the deeper truth can be seen once more. So the story sets a scene. The scene then does shift to a particular encounter. Um, Dante sees one particular set of feet and flickering flames kicking, kicking more vigorously than the others and he asks Virgil um, you know, who, who that might be. And Virgil says to Dante, let me carry you down into the trench, into the bolger, in order that you may ask. It's very striking that Virgil carries Dante down. And in fact, we'll see that Virgil carries Dante back out again um, at the end. And this, um, at this stage, I think, is uh, indicating that um, Virgil and Dante are working very closely together now. Um, you know, their, their minds are becoming aligned. Uh, Dante is very much um, uh, the student of his master um, in this canto, you know, perhaps echoing how the leaders of the church failed to do that for the souls they're supposed to be looking after themselves. Um, but I think also emphasising um, that Dante in his learning is taking Virgil into himself. He's learning, as it were, about his own inner voice um, that will be able to speak truth to power, in fact. Um, and that's symbolised by this kind of carrying down into the bolger. But also just with this echo of be careful, um, you know, you're approaching something very powerful, actually, in doing this, in this descent. And so um, you must always be watching and careful and drawing on from the help and ultimately from the grace that is available round and about, not getting too cocky too quickly. 
So they they um, they actually go over the bridge um, that's over this particular bulge or over this particular trench, um, because as Virgil remarks, uh, one side will be lower than the other. The far side is lower than the near side because remember it's all um, descending um, into the well at the heart of hell. Um, so they cross over the bridge and then they make their way down um, into the bulger and approach this particular cylinder with the legs kicking out. And Dante asks, you know, speak, who are you, um, if you can make a voice at all? And immediately a voice does come back to them, um, and, um, but it's not one that addresses Dante directly. Um, again, we've had this, that when Dante asks souls in hell, they don't really see Dante. They're completely preoccupied with their own concerns. Um, that's part of their state of mind. Um, and so, too, this voice speaks out, is that you already, Boniface? The book has lied to me. You weren't supposed to be here for quite some years yet. And so we learn that this is a pope being punished in hell with his um, head stuck in the sand. Um, Dante remarks how odd this is for him now. Um, he's like, it says, a friar confessing an assassin. And this is an echo of how assassins in Florence were killed by having their heads put in the ground so that they suffocated. Um, and a friar, a monk, would be alongside them to catch any last minute confession. So Dante now finds himself in this remarkable, odd, unsettling position of having to confess to a pope. And, you know, when you remember the power, well, of, of any ecclesiastical leader, actually, the, the kind of power of their office, the power of their charisma, and the power of the deference that's routinely showed to them, um, and think this is a medieval pope, um, you know, when that deference and power perhaps has been amplified more than at any other time, um, you get some sense of, of now the shock um, that might be affecting Dante as he finds himself in this position. So for the background story here is that Boniface, um, referred to as Boniface VIII, um, he was a pope um, after um, 1300, the year in which um, the Divine Comedy is set. Um, and he's noticeable for being a very worldly pope. Um, in particular, he got his predecessor, who was uh, called uh, Celestine um, the Fifth, yeah, Celestine the Fifth, um, to resign, um, to abdicate being pope. Uh, Celestine was thought to have been a kind of holy pope, um, a hermit, in fact, um, and he only lasted a few short weeks in office before um, Nicholas, uh, sorry, before Boniface. Um, comes and um, uh, gets him to abdicate. Um, so, you know, we're getting quite a complex picture here of, of how the papacy operates. Um, the Pope, who's actually in hell, saying, is that you, Boniface, and then learning that it's not, um, is Nicholas III. Um, he too was a Roman nobleman, another very worldly um, Pope. Um, and what's striking about Nicholas and what he says um, is, you know, as I've already remarked, he responds to Dante with his own preoccupations. Um, he, he immediately says, is that you, Boniface? Um, and, you know, this is what institutions do, um, is that when you get caught up in the life of the institution and forget that it's supposed to be serving a much bigger life, um, in the case of the church, serving divine life, the ups and downs of institutional life become all prepossessing. Um, they completely... Um, occupy your horizon so you can't see anything other than at one level the latest bit of gossip in the church um, but at another level um, the kind of wider um, unfoldings of the church for the church's sake for the sake of its own power and that's precisely what happens to Nicholas here too when he references Boniface. Um, it's underlined as well because he says um, this remark you know the book has lied um, the interpretation here is that this is a kind of book of prophecy, um, which many of these souls have a kind of limited capacity for in hell, in these um, uh, in-between um, states, somewhere between heaven and earth. Um, but it's often a confused and ill-discerned prophecy. And that's what happens here as well, that Nicholas has a kind of intimation that his successor Boniface is going to join him in this infernal state. Um, but because he's so preoccupied um, with um, his own um, sort of suffering, his own um, bitterness, um, he's misunderstood the prophecy as well and so thinks it's going to happen more quickly um, than it, it is. Um, so 
you know, this, this prophetic capacity often illustrates um, their own perversions, their own self-obsessions, um, even as they receive these intimations of the future that are then misunderstood. A third thing that happens is that Nicholas um, chastises Boniface um, for prostituting the church for money, for power, for gain, for wealth, um, this, 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 this sin of simony, um, when he doesn't turn his eye to himself and see how he too was doing the very same thing. Again, another thing that you just see happening in institutions, people criticising others without realising they're implicated too in what's going on. Um, it's a reflection of another remark from the Gospels um, where you can't see the plank in your own eye because you're obsessed with the speck in your neighbour's eye. Um, what this is building up to, I think in this point in the dialogue, in the canto, um, and thinking particularly about how it's looking at the systemic view from the top down as much as individual souls from the bottom up, um, is I think a strong indictment of the papacy as such. If you have these big institutions that supposedly stand for spiritual goods here in this world, they inevitably sell out, they inevitably become preoccupied with their temporal power, with their con continuity. Um, they'll tell you it's about doing good in the world and the complication is that in part it is. Um, but at the same time you can see how the corruption creeps in. You know, we can look back now at the medieval church, it's become almost infamous for corruption, and um, particularly around the papacy. Um, but it carries on now. Um, when I think of the Church of England, the church that I actually know the best, um, it seems to me that it routinely um, will um, crucify individual souls to maintain its own status. Um, you see this particularly um, in debates around love um, and um, whose relationships can be blessed and whose can't. Um, you see that the bishops, in a way, inevitably have an eye on the impact that this is going to have on the church's standing, um, not just in England, but around the globe. Um, and they inevitably sacrifice um, individual acts of love for the future continuity of the church. Um, that's just what happens. Um, I think Dante is pointing to that in his time, and um, it, it carries on um, with us now. Um, I mean, simony itself, um, not just to blame the church, um, is, I think, very now widespread um, in our culture. Um, when you think about, say, the number of goods that are sold with a kind of spiritual aura, you know, cars um, can be sold as if they're going to give you a kind of infinite power. Um, or, um, I don't know, beauty products are sold as if they're going to make you glow like an angel. Um, when you start watching ads and seeing the number that are associated with essentially spiritual tropes, you know, maybe kind of um, heavenly scenes or um, candles, uh, diaphanous curtains. Um, you know, in our very secular world, lots of secular things are sold with a kind of spiritual aura. Um, you know, it's like simile hasn't become less of a problem in the modern world. It's almost become the way of the modern world. Um, similarly, um, overtly spiritual practices, spiritual goods get sold um, or maybe even oversold because of their temporal benefits. You know, meditation that's sold because it helps you deal with the stresses of the day so that you can stay at work. Um, this is now very, very common. Um, uh, you know, kind of overselling um, what were spiritual practices that were supposed to show you none, you know, no less than the path to the divine or at least to a kind of enlightenment, um, but they're reduced to kind of keeping you operative um, in this world, even whilst they overlay this spiritual aura. Um, I think another way this happens um, is when um, spirituality is sold as a, as a kind of spectacle, you know, come and see the power, come and see the healing, come and see the speaking in tongues. Um, again, it's a kind of temporal thrill um, that eclipses um, the deeper spiritual subtlety um, and it's very easy for that to replace um, why people get drawn to these things. Um, and of course, in a numbers game uh, where you know success is very quickly allied with expansion and growth, um, that temptation, that simony can become all pervasive and can become uh, what, you know the kind of guiding motive, in fact, um, when you start to look at what's going on.
this this pope kicking his feet inverted in this hole nicholas now tells his story and it's very clear that that's his preoccupation was how to um to bring favor to as he calls it his bear cubs um his own children his own family um he remains bitter throughout his um conversation with dante um and his feet kick all the more um uh, that clearly is um uh, the um, state that his soul is gripped in. Um, this is one moment perhaps of hope because, as we'll see, Dante speaks back to the Pope um, and, and tries to show him what's gone so wrong. And Dante wonders whether the, the Pope's feet are now kicking out of conscience, perhaps rather than rage. We don't really know whether that's the case um, or not. Um, maybe it's one of these kind of glimmers of hope, even in the depths of hell, when people feel shame or they feel a prick of conscience returning to them. Um, but what we do know happens is that Dante gains a kind of voice. Um, he gains his capacity to speak truth to power. Um, it's as if he's the anointed one. He's the one that's got the true spirit within him now. And so having started off dumbstruck when he'd realised he was standing next to an inverted pope, um, he now gains um, a kind of authority and he sums it up by saying avarice, this excessive greed and this excessive preoccupation with material goods brings great grief to the world, he says. Um, it crushes the good and it exalts the depraved. And it's a kind of summary of why um, this particular sin of simony is so very destructive and why Dante meets it so directly in Malabolge, in this lower eighth circle of hell. Dante then names what he thinks is the what you might call the original sin um, of this state that the church particularly finds itself in. Um, it's a document called the Donation of Constantine. Um, it goes back to the early popes of the popes of the fourth century, um, when Constantine gave temporal power um, to I think it's Pope Sylvester um, in the fourth century, um, and so the church became preoccupied with the maintenance of its temporal power inevitably as these institutions do. Um, he, he laments um, that moment that ever happened and sees that as the beginning of what's now become an all-pervasive, all... Um, I, I wonder if he's intimating in this canto, actually um, insurmountable problem um, uh, that uh, the church now finds itself in. It's certainly the case that Virgil is delighted um, Virgil sees um, his student finding his full range, his full authority, speaking from um, the good place within him, not being crushed, not being depraved. And as if to celebrate, um, he then carries um, Dante out of the Bolgia, much as he carried him in. Only this time it says he carries him to his heart, he carries him to his chest, and then gently puts him down when they reach um, the, the, the top of the, of the bank um, again. Um, you know, I think this is symbolic that their their hearts are now very close. Their minds, their learning, their insight, their understanding, their desire, their will is at this moment at least quite um, knitted together, quite well aligned, and that's what gives Virgil such joy. He's getting joy out of seeing good flourishing. Um, he's getting joy out of the clarity of Dante's sight, even though initially he'd been dumbstruck and confused and really quite intimidated and shocked. But we're still continuing through the descent. Things are going to change rather remarkably in the next canto. And indeed, Dante tells us that as soon as he'd been put down by Virgil, immediately another deep valley opened up to him. <laughs>